Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for National eSign Day. My name is Michelle Kloninger, and I'm our Marketing Manager for AssureSign. We're extremely excited for our webinar topic today, eSignature, the cornerstone of digital transformation. Now, I don't want to take up too much of your time, as this will be an info-packed hour with some very entertaining guests, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But I would like to cover a few things before we get started. First off, happy National eSign Day. If you don't already know what makes this day so exciting, you'll find out in just a bit. Second, we will include a recording of the presentation in a follow-up email, so keep an eye out in your inbox for that. And finally, we will have a few minutes at the end of today's session for a Q&A. Feel free to submit questions using the chat bar on the side during the presentation, and we'll make sure that we get to them. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenters. Joining us today, we have Dave Brinkman, active board member of ESRA, which is the Electronic Signature and Records Association, as well as president and CEO of AssureSign. And Margot Tank, who is also an active member of ESRA, partner of Buckley Sandler, and much more. Now, Dave, I'll let you take it away. Well, th thank you, Michelle. And, uh, and Margot, happy eSign day. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, Margot and I uh, have known each other for, for quite a while. Uh, you can see our bios. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, um, that Margot allowed me to share some of the first screen. Um, I have been uh, an active board member with uh, Ezra, as Michelle mentioned, uh, served as its chairman and uh, vice chairman and also conference chair. Uh, Margot and I uh, co-chaired last year's Ezra conference together in New York City. Uh, Margot uh, has an impressive resume. Uh, among those uh, things I think are, are most impress impressive are, are the fact that she was the former counsel to the uh, U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Banking and Financial Services. Uh, also, she has been recognized throughout the industry uh, as, a, uh, as a leader uh, and an author as well. So as the, uh, the author of the electronic signatures and uh, the law of electronic signatures and records. So, Margot, thank you for uh, for uh, taking some time today to uh, to to chat with us about um, eSign Day and uh, and really the the broader question of um, of electronic signature and records and digital transformation. Thank you, Dave. Um, hard to follow the the adjectives entertaining, impressive, and much more. <laughs> so I was thinking hopefully. the same thing. Entertaining was the one that scared me the most, but uh, okay. Off we go. So, um, so, so, Margo, you were there in the beginning, uh, and and for uh, uh, for for folks that don't know, you and uh, and Jerry Buckley and. Um, um, and David Whitaker were, were all kind of on the front line of the uh, federal e-sign uh, law. Um, what was it? What was it like to uh, to be uh, to be there where, when when it all got started? Sure. So, just a little bit of background. Um, you have to recall the environment back in 1998. The internet was taking off. Everyone wanted to be a part of it, both technology companies and end users. And as lawyers in the financial services space, we were getting a lot of questions from banks and mortgage companies about you know, if they were to build a consumer-facing portal, how could they deliver disclosures and find documents when most of the federal consumer protection laws and related state laws had quote-unquote you know, writing and signing requirements or original requirements. Um, so you had mortgage companies and banks saying, you know, we want to get rid of our paper. We understand it's more efficient and you know, will save costs. Um, and we want to go consumer direct. You know, how do we do that? And then on the other side of it, we had technology companies like Microsoft and Tuit, some of the big ones, who were saying, hey, we want to get into the financial services business. Um, how can we build, we've got the portal, we have the interface, we can act as finders, um, almost the first wave of FinTech, you know, if you will. Uh, so they were coming to us and saying, you know, how do we also, you know, meet these writing and signing requirements and how do we do this electronically and how do we get licensed as, you know, mortgage brokers or mortgage lenders um, if we sort of play in the transaction. 
So my colleague, as Dave mentioned, colleagues, um, but at the time it was just uh, Jerry Buckley and then David Whitaker came on the scene a little bit later. He was at Freddie Mac at the time. But both Jerry and I had, um, you know, we had worked on the Hill. Um, I had worked uh, on the House Banking Committee um, more recently. Jerry was on the, on the Senate side. And so we were you know, familiar with the process and familiar with putting together trade associations. So we worked and brought both the technology companies and the end user to create a trade association, and it was called the Electronic Financial Services Council. And our first project was to find a way to achieve legal certainty with regard to how to meet these signing and writing requirements in an electronic uh, environment. So we did a little research and um, looked to see, and lo and behold, there were a few bills in both the House and Senate Commerce Committees, and they were exclusively focused on digital signatures. And we said, oh, this is great. You know, this is a good start, but they really need to be expanded to enable the delivery of disclosures and to have a broader definition of um, an electronic signature, not just a digital signature. So right. and, and, we'll, and we'll get to that difference too. I, I know mm -hmm. everybody is they kind of use digital signatures and electronic signatures interchangeably, and so we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So digital signature is just a subset of an electronic signature. But we wanted to broaden the concept because at the same time, so this was, you know, 1999-ish, um, in 1998, the Uniform Law Commission came out with the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, and eSign, which the federal law, which fast forward, was enacted in 2000, was going to follow, or we were trying to have it follow, the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. We didn't want to create you know, even more confusion than there already was. So UIDA um, had a definition of an electronic signature that was, was broad, and we'll talk a little bit more about you know, that definition and, and the differences as uh, Dave alluded to. Um, but the problem with UIDA, while the definitions were good and the framework was good, in the past, when the Uniform Law Commission would put forth model laws, you know, each state has to adopt the law, and they can change it. And we were really seeking for, A, true uniformity, and B, to do this as fast as we possibly can. Because, as I said, there was just a lot of um, energy and excitement and you know, a little bit the fever pitch that we feel you know, now with respect to technology. It was the same idea you know, then. Um, so, you know, it took about a year, so we started the trade association, it took about a year to get eSign actually enacted, and it wasn't, you know, it was a bumpy road, essentially. It wasn't as easy as you would think um, it would be. The Clinton administration, who ultimately, Bill Clinton was the, the, the president who signed the law, um, they, they were opposed. The Clinton administration was flat out opposed, and some of the comments from you know high level officials were you know literally quote unquote over my dead body um, will this you know bill get passed and you know the digital divide is just too great so it doesn't make sense it's, you know now is not the right time for this um, and the consumer groups were you know aligned with the Clinton administration and they were concerned that consumers would be duped that a sales representative would use you know, door-to-door -door sales tactics to obtain signatures, you know, press here, click here, and not provide um, meaningful opportunity to review the disclosures and, you know, allow the consumer to keep it, keep the disclosures, which were part of the underlying consumer protection law requirements. So the consumer groups were opposed. Uh, the, the bill, you know, had its fits and starts and um, to, you know, cut to the chase, uh, almost died, but the group worked with Congressman Inslee, who at the time uh, was, uh, now he's governor of the state of Washington, but at the time he was representing the state of Washington, where, you know, Microsoft and other uh, technology companies resided, and he put together a group of Democrats that would be 
able to support the bill if there were adequate consumer protections. So we drafted uh, what is referred to as the consumer consent provision, which essentially has disclosures about the, the scope of the transaction that will be done electronically, requires an affirmative you know, opt-in consent, yes, I want to do business electronically. And we didn't um, draft this in, but the Clinton administration did uh, the reasonable demonstration requirement, uh, which essentially was to alleviate um, concerns that um, information would be provided and the recipient of the information wouldn't have the form or format to review it. So remember back in 1998, 99, 2000, PDF was not so readily available. You had to actually download and, you know, Word was, Word Perfect was morphing to Word and there was all kinds of concerns about information being provided and not being able to be read uh, by the recipient. So that seemed to work and um, the sign was, was passed and enacted by both houses and then signed by Bill Clinton, June um, 30th, uh, 2000. And and so we went from we went from there, and you know it, it sounds like all of those machinations really helped to produce a a law that uh, to to this day pretty much stands unchanged, which is kind of unheard of. It was it was open enough to allow business to adopt it and and look for some stability in and how they needed to conduct their business, but as you mentioned, also gave those consumer protection. Uh, provisions that I think were were so helpful, and so um, and, and I know we we talked about this uh, in, in a previous conversation, but but the law itself has become the basis for uh, for laws internationally. I think um, you know th there were a couple of things that that struck me about it. One is the fact that um, uh, that it, it it's able to be an an overlay statute so you didn't have to go through and essentially rewrite all of the rules where it said written and and change it to written or electronically signed right that was pretty important oh absolutely um, <clears throat> you had both you know UEDA um, and eSign so eSign following UEDA UEDA following UNCTRL and the, the sort of international model law all saying the same thing creating the same you know, framework, we refer to that as overlay statutes. So you wouldn't have to go in and amend every single federal and state law to change, you know, a writing and assigning requirement to be an electronic record or an electronic signature. So these rules were, you know, procedural rules, they were overlay rules, they authorized replacing writings with electronic records, and they authorized electronic signatures, um, opt-in, so it was choice, it wasn't forced upon the consumer, um, all of those aspects of um, the framework were, were important and as Dave, as you said, sort of the test of time, that there hasn't been a need to change any of that. And and I know there's a there's a, there's one story that I heard in particular that that um, that had had you um, um, taking uh, suggestions from David Whitaker while writing on the back of Jerry outside of a committee room as in, in uh, what was uh, around midnight I think as I recall correctly uh, but it's it's uh, it's amazing when you uh, when you hear how the laws are are made uh, it really is it is uh, sausage making when it when it comes to uh, to Capitol Hill and and uh, so yeah, th those those kind of stories I think are really uh, uh, entertaining as well well, it was um, quite fun at the time. David Whitaker was at Freddie Mac, and Fannie and Freddie were deep into the e-mortgage, you know, business and trying to really, you know, promote that vertical. Um, David called and said, um, you know, here we we Freddie would really like to make sure that the transferable records provisions that were at Section 16 of UEDA are also included in, in eSign. And so, you know, we're driving up to the hill, Jerry and I, and, and I'm taking notes, you know, and leaning on Jerry to take notes and writing down everything that David told me to write down and, you know, go up and, you know, present it to, to the committee. Um, so that was like one really, really important day because those provisions ended up being 
included, which really became sort of the, the baseline for um, for the mortgage industry. Um, and we had many other you know moments like that where Commerce Committee called uh, midnight, you know, in the pouring rain. Um, and it wasn't just the EFSC, it was a, it was a few other um, uh, investment company institute and a few other companies, uh, but a relatively small group that were called up to, to the Hill at midnight and, you know, we drafted all night long. So once the administration got over the, um, you know, over my dead body aspect of this and realized that there were companies, you know, nationwide and large companies and small companies that really were craving for um, this, the efficiencies of going electronic, and they understood that eSign was going to be a gating uh, law that needed, you know, it needed a, a backstop, a, a federal backstop. Then they were, you know, all on board. So then it became, you know, all all effort, regardless of time, to to get it done. Right. So we've been looking at this uh, screen here for uh, for a few minutes here about electronic signature and, and and we use it all the time in our business. But what an electronic signature means, right? So it's this it's the electronic sound symbol or process um, associated with and adopted uh, by a person with the intent to sign a record. It, what was incredible to me was uh, that 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 statement there did not involve any technology. It didn't say this is how you had to do it. it was very Open and forward-looking, and and uh, and that that definition as well has has stood the test of time. Uh, what what made that um, that e-sign uh, bill and, and law such a success? What, were there were there particular parts about it? Well, you read it in e-sign basically continue the long history of common law flexibility toward what constitutes an electronic signature, and were you know specifically designed to you know, eliminate legal sufficiency defense. So the idea was to have a very broad definition in any sound simpler process. Technology neutrality, uh, let a thousand blossoms bloom, you know, let the marketplace take hold, and have an extremely broad definition. So a type name, a click through, a recorded, by, a recorded voice, a, a pin, a password, a biometric, um, digitized image, cryptographic, you know, PKI, digital signature, all of those things could meet the definition of right. uh, an electronic signature. And, and I often uh, ask folks uh, when, when I'm, I'm speaking uh, how many people have signed electronically. Now that number has gone up dramatically over the last couple of years, but you generally get about half of the crowd that raises their hands, but uh, how many people have, uh, for instance, installed software on their computer or, or um, uh, had some place where they had to click to agree, right? So that, that meets the requirements of an electronic signature. Uh, and so it, people are, are always surprised to, to find out um, that, that they have, in fact, been electronically uh, agreeing and signing things for, for years. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, a simple signature, we'll just call the I agree button or a checkbox, a simple signature, all the way to the more sort of elaborate um, PKI um, approach. It really just depends on the risk in the transaction. Um, is it going to be conducted remotely or in person? Is it for buying a book for $10 on Amazon, or is it doing a mortgage transaction or an insurance transaction? Um, so the type of signature that you use really is impacted by the type of transaction. Any of the types are going to be legally sufficient, so long as you can show that the customer who signed had the intent to sign. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. And intent is outside of e-sign, and you use all the common law and all the contract law principles for the paper world, and you port them over into the electronic world. So up on the screen, we've got your the the three pillars that you've often referred to um, uh, as as uh, kind of the the pillars that hold up e-sign. Sure. So we refer to um, the simplicity. Uh, of the statute as the three pillars, and essentially what that means is a record or signature may not be denied legal 
effect or enforceability solely because it's in electronic form. So the key is solely because it's in electronic form. It could be denied for other purposes, but not just because it's electronic. That's number one. Number two, if a law requires a record to be in writing, an electronic record satisfies the law. And three, if a law requires a signature, an electronic signature satisfies the law. So fairly, fairly simple. Um, that's the overlay effect and the procedural idea uh, that you're just having a law that enables the replacement of writing and sign, signing requirements, so long as you play by the rules um, and, and address all the requirements um, in, in eSign. So we, we've talked about electronic signature um, for, for a while now, but uh, with respect to jurisdictions, um, U.S. How, how do they? How does the U.S. rank uh, with with uh, respect to the rest of the world? Or are we leading um, the rest of the world? Or or uh, or is the rest of the world? Um, are, are they catching up? How how do how do you see that from from where you sit? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. Most countries have electronic signature laws. Uh, I would say that. Um, there are a few Nordic uh, countries uh, that are leaders, but the reason why is because they have a you know, population is is less and trust is high. Um, the rest of the world is is struggling with um, two things, including the United States: um, authentication, so identifying the parties to a transaction, and um, record integrity. So it's not about the signature anymore. Um, it's not about original requirements, but it's you know the bookends of the transaction. So I'd say you know well we may be ahead, the United States may be ahead in, in certain respects um, because they're they're able to do risk based analysis. Um, Europe has a little bit more propensity towards certainty, um, in particular Germany. But you know it, it's 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 happening in a broad sense, but globally countries are wrestling with, um, with adoption, and, but it's happening. Right, and, and do you see that as, as, a, as a function of, uh, of, of common law versus civil law, or just uh, kind of a, uh, more, more of a, um, I don't know, uh, a well, culture of, uh, of, of, of making sure that you know, what, what you're doing is absolutely 100% guaranteed? Uh, it's all of that. It's absolutely cultural um, and common law and civil law just depending in what country and what jurisdiction. Um, but culture has a, a, a very large role in this. So we talked a little bit about um, uh, attribution and authentication. Um, it, it, describe for for uh, we've, it's been woven within kind of the first 25 minutes or so of this. Um, what do you? How do you separate those? When somebody says to you, "What's a digital signature versus an electronic signature?" So I would just I would say that um, as we described before, an electronic signature is any sound similar process. Um, executed with the intent to sign and logically associated. So you have a method, you have intent, and you have a logical association. But you don't know, you know whether the signer is who they say they are, um, have, has authority, or what they're signing is going to remain intact. But there are other ways to solve for all those problems in an in a electronic process. Um, a digital signature um, has all those attributes, right? So if you have a, there's lots of ways to have a digital signature, but you have a, you know, the authentication, um, perhaps by a third party, you know, uh, certifying uh, that you are who you are, um, you know, issuing a credential that can be used and applied and um, only by the person who was issued to, because they then, um, you know, use a PIN or a password. And then the integrity of the document is protected because of the PKI and encryption mechanisms. So it's just it's it's taking all those issues and um, kind of compressing them into one form of signature, right. one form yeah. of electronic signature. And from from our perspective, right, a, a digital signature that's required by consumers creates a barrier, creates friction in the transaction. 
Um, and, and so there's obviously there's other ways to guarantee or to assure um, uh, authenticity or, or uh, attribution in, in assigning. And I, some of those things that, that, that you'll find is either uh, knowledge-based authentication, even the, the, um, the sharing of a PIN or a password, um, or, um, or, or even some type of two-factor authentication where you're validating that not only does the person know the password, but they may also have access to another device. Uh, and typically you'll see that uh, to where you'll get a code texted to you or emailed to you that, uh, that shows that you, you have uh, additional um, uh, points of, of uh, authentication in the, in the process. Uh, so, a couple of a couple other things. Um, I know when when you were talking about this in in the beginning, uh, you said Freddie Mac uh, was involved. It sounds like uh, the mortgage industry was was one of the early adopters and drivers. The, yes, the the mortgage industry was um, almost the first vertical uh, in the financial services space. Um, out of the gate to use and electronic signatures. Um, the MBA, Mortgage Bankers Association, and, and NISMO, their standard setting body, um, and Freddie and Fannie had put a lot of effort into you know, creating the all electronic mortgage, um, which would include complete life cycle from disclosure delivery to closing to you know, custody transfer and purchase into sale and purchase to secondary market. Um, I guess the the, the problem, um, you should say, all right, well, so they were early and they were out often, and this law you signed has been you know on the books for 16 years. You know, why haven't I seen this? Um, part of the the problems were it's a very large you know ecosystem, much larger and harder to get everybody upstream and downstream, you know, in agreement as to how to do the transaction. So insurance may be easier, auto finance may be easier, student lending easier. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, uptick and um, the numbers are good in, in those verticals, um, notwithstanding that, that mortgage um, was first. And I, I think for everybody, and I don't want to sound too negative, but just understanding, you know, some of the obstacles and frustrations, um, and some of the confusion over the law, you know, has led to a slower um, adoption rate. You know, lack of guidance on key issues from regulators. You know, what does reasonable demonstration mean? No, you know, standards, um, outmoded regulatory requirements. Um, Lots of questions on build versus buy, and over the years, you know, we've seen companies who say, "Oh, you know, I'm going to build it myself," um, and two years later, they're calling and saying, "Oh, well, you know, <laughs> didn't work out so well. You know, which vendor should we call? You know, who's in the business? Who does what?" Um, it's it's hard. It's, it takes a lot of time to understand the business process and the interaction and build the technology. Uh, in a way that's um, that's usable, um, the lack of judicial guidance was significant for a really long time. Although that's not so significant anymore, um, market participants didn't necessarily perceive the benefit of first mover advantage, um, and so on. So, well, mortgage was first. Um, 2008 was a big kind of pullback. Um, the financial crisis, their resources were devoted to um, staying in business, not, not redefining business process um, as we know it today. Um, Dave, I don't know what you want to talk a little bit about insurance and or maybe I finished the good news about the mortgage industry. That, <laughs> The yeah, so so P and C was if if you think of industries that are are heavily paper um, dependent, 
insurance is one of those. Uh, and so uh, we've seen just a tremendous amount of adoption, both early on and even even as of today. There, there's uh, there's new um, uh, companies coming onto the uh, onto the uh, electronic signature bus that uh, that uh, have been kind of hanging around. It's it's funny, kind of some of the motivations. Um, from an e-signature standpoint have moved from, hey, this is a great thing that will help us uh, streamline our business to, um, hey, you know what, our consumers are not accepting the fact that we would want them to print off sign and fax or scan something back to us, and it becomes a competitive disadvantage. And so um, you know, PNC has, has continued to, to, uh, to grow for us. Um, financial services is another. Uh, where those those types of things had been a, a challenge in the past, um, so yeah, we're we're, we're seeing um, uh, kind of out, out of it's 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 been a short 16 years, right? So when we look at it all, we uh, we we count the years, but uh, really this has been something that's been out there for a while. Um, so National e Sign Day, um, we we um, uh, on June 30th uh, in in 2010. Um, uh, I know that um, you were you were part of it, but uh, the e-sign um, uh, day was actually recognized uh, by the uh, by the House of Representatives, and uh, and that was kind of a uh, it was a PR thing, but it was really to say, hey, you know what, um, electronic signatures are here. This is something that that we should look at. Uh, that's something that businesses should adopt. Um, and, and so, what, what's uh, what's your um, uh, you were you were involved in kind of helping uh, get this uh, e-sign day recognized. What what were your your um, recollections with with respect to that? Well, all those obstacles and frustrations I was just talking about were you know were out there, and you know working with um, Ezra. So the EFSC, the Electronic Financial Services Council, had. Um, were morphed into the Electronic Signature and Records Association. And the mission was to, you know, educate and be advocates for electronic signatures and records. And, you know, all of those sort of obstacles were out there and we thought, what is it that we can do to remind everybody that there is this federal law and Congress passed it and they really meant it. And, you know, try to generate some, some comfort. Um, lots of confusion, and um, so essentially the idea was to have government agencies, um, because they were part of the frustration and confusion, because they weren't speaking when asked, um, and the courts were silent. Um, and companies were waiting and waiting and waiting. So, like I said, the idea was to um, bring it back up and have Congress uh, bless it again. Like, yes, uh, we really meant it. Um, so there were two resolutions that were introduced, one half on the Senate, to have June 30th be commemorated as National um, E-Sign Day. And there were um, many, many companies um, many trade associations and industry, you know, leaders that were that were all supporting it. So now we have something to celebrate, and hopefully, um, there'll be a tipping point sooner rather than later. So, yeah, uh, and so we've been talking about, um, the, or the the title of the webinar was the the cornerstone. So we've been spending a lot of time kind of laying the cornerstone, and and really this, you know. Uh, a cornerstone, if you think about it, and building the the building is is really where you start. It's the anchor. It's the um, you know it's the the piece that gets you there. The rest of the building kind of rests upon that that cornerstone. Um, and uh, and so you know we now we're looking at at a larger idea, which is digital transformation. And um, and and also another term that's been out in the uh, um, out in the in the world is is uh, DTM the digital transaction management, and uh, and so um, you know we we um, as we've kind of started to to move through uh, those definitions, uh, digital transaction management as as uh, as we 
talk about it is really just it's the process of, of maintaining the integrity of the process in a digital environment uh, from the, the creation of, of the uh, transaction to the, the execution to the, to the archival of the, of the transaction. Uh, would, would you agree with that? Yes. And, uh, and, and when we, we look at digital transformation, digital transformation is, is much more uh, of a, of a wide-ranging um, um, idea. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've been dealing with kind of the, the, the beginning, I think you mentioned it early on, which was, uh, so now that you've got an electronic signature process, you know, so now what's the next step, right? And so digital transaction management is a part of that. But uh, one of the things that uh, when, when you're looking at digital transformation, um, I think it's important to understand uh, that it's not just a machine thing. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things that we're going to be providing uh, today is a, uh, is a report by Aragon Research, The Rise of the Digital Business Platform. And, and when I was reading through that report, this, this was one of their uh, seven different points. But essentially it says that you know, us as the humans uh, need to be considered as, as part, of this, uh, part of this solution, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it can't be... Um, it can't be just a, uh, a process that, it, that is not intuitive. If you think about it from a larger uh, perspective, we are, uh, we are being trained by our, uh, our technology. Um, I mean, could, could you think of you know, 10 or 15 years ago getting a smartphone and not having an instruction manual, right? <laughs> Everything had an instruction manual. Now it has to right. be... Uh, now it just has to be intuitive. I have to. It has to make sense. And and in order to achieve that digital transformation, um, you know, you, you have to include the human machine in, in the process and how it interacts uh, with with the technology and and the technology with itself and with with the uh, the human machine. Right. You know, at, you said it's not just a machine thing. So you know, DPM was, you know, enforceability, scalability, availability, assurance, all of those things where digital transformation is more about mindset and intuitiveness and, you know, pressing the it's easy button um, and adoption rate um, that is crossing the chasm, I guess, in a, in a way that um, you, you bring everybody you bring everybody safely and easily along. Exactly, and uh, and so it, this is almost one of those times that when when we look at, at businesses at new businesses that are that are just starting up and and they're starting without the uh, without the legacy uh, systems that they have to work around. They're they're in sometimes at an advantage over an established business uh, just simply because they're able to define this digital process. Um, and 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 achieve digital transformation in a much um, more you know simple and ro a robust way than than somebody who has to deal with you know 25 years of legacy systems and databases. Um, the um, so so um, what what do you see are uh, are any of the other challenges that um, that are out there? With respect to digital transformation, is there is there something that can be drawn? Uh, is is there a parallel that be, can be drawn with uh, electronic signature and electronic signature adoption? Well, I guess I'm hopeful that you know I mentioned this you know term before that we're at the the tipping point. Um, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle seem to be in place, right? That the technology is available and it's robust. You know, 16, 18 years ago, it was there, but it was clunky. Um, and people had a web page, but it wasn't dynamic, you know. So, I, you know, the technology is, is there. Um, you know, velocity compared to paper and dramatically measurable faster transaction times, you know, they're here. They're 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 really happening and they're being measured and um, far less transaction breakage 
um, losses, uh, the ROI, it's, it's there, the consumer demand, um, which I think is going to be the real driver, um, yep. is real and present. Um, the regulators, so, here, so these are all the pieces, right? You've got you know, velocity, consumer demand, regulators want more transparency in the transaction. They want the transaction record, the audit trail. They want, and, and because technology can enable all that, they're, they're coming along. Um, compliance, process management, the law can be you know, built in or you know, woven through the technology and the transactions. Um, businesses need to be more efficient. They need to use the data that they're gathering in a, a better way to be you know, competitive. Um, all of this is sort of occurring. I think it's ready. Uh, there's predictable outcomes. There's measurable reduced costs. Um, the courts are there. So I think the, the, the time is right. So you know, both DPM and you know, uh, digital transformation um, are parallel tracks and are aligned. And you know, there should be a lot of movement in the next. So by 2020, um, hopefully, people will be like, really? You guys spent an hour talking about this? Um, and it, it will become uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, the the 16 years that it took us to get to here, I think, has has uh, has really um, enabled us to to kind of move forward uh, and and uh, quicken the adoption of the digital transformation. Now it's going to be up to uh, kind of our our visionaries within uh, within business who can understand mm -hmm. what digital transformation means and, um, and and come up with a plan to adopt that within their own business. Um, Margot, I'd I'd, um, I'd like to thank you for for uh, working uh, with us and kind of sharing your knowledge today. I uh, I know Michelle has um, a couple of things. We we are also available to uh, to take questions. So there's the 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 uh, questions block or chat block uh, on your control. Uh, so you can uh, you can ask any questions that you have. We can uh, we can take those. We can answer um, any of your uh, um, uh, concerns or ideas uh, with respect to electronic signature or digital transformation. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much, Margo and Dave. That was a really informative and really insightful um, presentation. I know that we're coming close to the hour, so I do want to jump into just a few questions we had. Um, the first one was, do the e-commerce laws apply to business-to-business -business transactions? So I'll take that one and then um, the, the legal question. We get that a lot. So we start off by, because the big bugaboo in e-sign is this consumer consent provision, which I mentioned earlier. So everyone sort of has a takeaway, thinks that it just applies to consumer transactions. It doesn't. It, it both UIDA and ESIN apply to business to business transactions. There's just less um, to do to comply with ESIN uh, and UIDA in a business to business transaction. But they both laws, both e-commerce laws, enable a uh, full transaction in business and consumer environment. And there are some exceptions. Um, there are some types of disclosures. Uh, that um, the laws um, prohibit, but essentially uh, it's a broad, broad coverage. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, business to business is is um, it, it depends. A lot of um, a lot of our our customers are dealing with quantity, uh, and so any kind of high volume transaction uh, ends up being an easy candidate for uh, for you know digitization and and, and use of electronic signature. Um, the um, a business to consumer is kind of fits that model, uh, but business to business uses it every day as well. Do we have another question, Michelle? We do, and, and thank you both for that. Um, we do have another question. Um, is there a retention period required for contracts and disclosures in eSign? In eSign itself, um, section 
101D and 101E essentially say that the information needs to be retained in a form that's accurate and accessible for the period of time required by the underlying law. So that's the e-sign requirement. Then you look to the underlying law, and when I say underlying law, that's either state or federal law that applies to the transaction. And you look at, at that, like Federal Truth and Lending Act, for example, it's you know, 24 months. So you would need to retain the information on, on the provider side for 24 months. We get that question a lot. For some reason, you know, people think, oh, everything's electronic and it's easy. You know, do we need to have file drawers or you know, files anymore? And you know, the answer to that question is think paper. What's your paper process? What are your paper requirements? It may be less expensive. It may be easier. You don't need you know, multiple systems or multiple file drawers. You have one system, uh, but you still need to meet um, retention requirements. And and uh, and that's exactly what we we tell folks as well. Is uh, it's 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 an underlying law. It's a business requirement, right? So, whatever you're doing with paper, you should uh, you should uh, mirror that with with electronic. Great, thank you. And we did just have another question come in. We do have a few more minutes, so I want to go ahead and try to get to these. Um, what do you think is in store for emerging markets for DTM or and or e-sign? Um, for example, in Southeast Asia, could the next uh, could the next big thing be there? Want so, to take that well, one, Dave? No, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Margo. No, go ahead. You go. <laughs> right. So, so what, what's I think what's happening? Uh, Southeast Asia is is a is a uh, is an is an opportunity. Obviously, uh, the EU continues to to be uh, an opportunity, and and I I think um, what what will what will drive them, whereas efficiency was driving us uh, initially, uh, I believe consumer um, consumer change and and requirements are going to be driving those in in other parts of the world. So so they'll kind of take a clue uh, from uh, from kind of what what has uh, has held adoption up in the U.S. Uh, for a number of years, uh, the the as you mentioned, the the underlying law around Uncitral and and UIDA, uh, was kind of adopted and and is uh, is commonplace, um, right? In in a number of these countries, they they talk about the electronic signature, or the electronic um, or advanced electronic uh, signature, or uh, or or some such thing. Um, so I do see them as a as a as a hotbed for uh, new opportunities, new uh, new business um, uh, to 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 essentially jump on the digital transformation. That region is you know technology use is high, um, mobile device is high, so you know consumer demand, mobile usage, um, smartphone usage is is going to to, to push the marketplace. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, like I said, it looks like we're coming up on the hour. Um, we want to thank everyone for attending today, and we hope that you all found it as enjoyable as we did. Um, look out for our follow-up emails. We will have the live recording in there. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of the day. And a big thanks to both Margo and, and Dave for jumping on this presentation today. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, everybody have a happy fourth uh, for this weekend. And um, as as Michelle said, you'll you'll get a copy uh, of uh, of both this presentation uh, and the um, the uh, analyst uh, paper from Aragon Research. So thank you for uh, contributing an hour of your time. Hopefully, we've been able to uh, to make it an informative hour. <laughs>